Hello, everyone. So welcome to today's Tech Excellence Meetup. So our vision is to raise the bar of technical excellence across the world. And the following is an overview of our um, past speakers as well as upcoming speakers. So please fo uh, follow us uh, here. You can su subscribe on YouTube. You can follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Also join our meetup group uh, as well as our GitHub community. So for today, uh, I'm really excited that Urs Enzler will be joining us to talk about a test-driven development perspectives. So what are the trade-offs and what's the impact of uh, functional programming? So perhaps before we go on further, maybe you could say a few words about yourself. Thank you, Valentina. Hi, everybody. I'm Urs. I'm from Switzerland. And I have 15 years experience of practicing test-driven development. And the way we practice TDD changed quite a bit over these 15 years. And I want to show you today where we, where we are now. It probably will change again, but it's uh, what we do at my job, at my company today. And I'm also a software architect, but actually we are a team of four developers that write a whole attendance time tracking application. Uh, we build it, we run it, so we do everything. So uh, modern speak, we are a DevOps team. <laughs> That's a good combination. So no yeah. solo developers and no Ivory ar uh, Tower architects yes. either. So I'm coding most of the times. Yeah. Wow. And maybe you could say something a bit about your mocking library. Oh, yeah. Uh, once upon a time, I was a maintainer of nmock2, a mocking library in .NET. Um, that's the reason why I don't use mocks anymore. I think it always happens when I know a concept very, very well, I realize that libraries aren't the way to go and I use a much simpler, customized for my problem solution um, when coding. So that happened with mocking libraries. Uh, that happened with, I once wrote an event broker. Some of you might know that from Prism. And nowadays, I wouldn't never use such a thing anymore. It's just too complex, too complicated. So, so. I think this is a go good introduction. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I just want to say, everyone, feel free to write any questions that you have any time in the chat. And we will also be looking at uh, going through the questions um, after the session. So I guess we could get uh, started now. So the first topic that we would want to look at is uh, a short introduction regarding uh, the architecture you have and perhaps and also an outline of where do tests fit in within that architecture. So both the higher and the lower level tests. Yes, exactly. So I will give you a short overview of our system. It's a system that runs in the cloud. It's a software as a service product that everybody in Switzerland currently can uh, uh, register for. And at the top, we have a client. And this is a Angular single page application. Yeah, we once decided Angular and we still stick with this decision. It's, it's OK. And the client talks with our backend through an ASP.NET web API. There are the controllers that we can make HTTP calls from the client to the backend. We have also some signal R magic to call from the backend to the client to update, to tell the client that it should update some data. But that's not important for today. More important is that the web API is actually just uh, an adapter that calls into what we call core. So seven years ago, we had to name the assembly and it was just named core. That's the reason why there's no 
which uh, no big fault behind the name. And the controllers in the web API, they call this core. And we always have um, what we call a facade. Um, so multiple controls can call this, uh, execute some operation or get some data with a query. And regarding TDD, this is uh, especially important because, let me scroll a bit, our tests, when you write a high level course test, we write this test against this facade here. So when you talk about hexagonal architecture, the hexagon would be the core here. So that would be the hexagon. Yes, and another thing just to add, the facade here is essentially the user side API or the user side ports to the hexagon. Exactly, yes. And that's so, so much it looks quite common, but I think now we do something different than most teams that we just don't have one big box in here and call it the business logic. We have what you call the first layer, you have subsystems. So we have multiple subsystems in here. Let me just draw two. We have about seven or eight, I think. I don't know, I have to count them. And the facade we call subsystem or it can call multiple subsystems regarding depending on the task that we want to accomplish now. Uh, I have one question. Uh, yeah. Assuming that this is probably monolithic architecture, to me, this looks like a modular monolith, as in each subsystem is kind of like a module within the yes, monolith. It's, it's, uh, we, we deploy everything at once. Therefore, it's a monolith. Uh, there are multiple processes running because it's uh, scaled onto multiple nodes. We also have Azure functions that mm -hmm. are deployed elsewhere, but conceptually it's a monolith, yes. And we have currently three and a half thousand users and it's absolutely no problem with performance. So we don't see uh, any reason to go into a more uh, microservice approach or something. We just don't see that for us. Yeah, but the good thing is that since the since it's already split into a modular in a modular way, when you do decide one day if it becomes necessary, then it's much easier to make that move versus companies which didn't yeah, have this split. Probably we would have to take care of latency. So if you have multiple hops, so that could be a problem. But yeah, it's easier when you have a really modularized system to make yeah. these, these thoughts if you could split out something and our subsystems could be good candidates for uh, individual service but again we want to scale to twenty five thousand users and we think that we can run it with the current architecture without problems that's great so um every subsystem so we have an attendance time tracking system so typical subsystems are um when you come to work when you go home that's the attendance time then we have the absence planning when you want to go on vacation or things like um, project time tracking or uh, scheduling um, if you have uh, service plans and things like this. These are all individual subsystems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to me, it looks like I mean, splitting on bounded contexts and then the subsystems are essentially. Uh, yeah, encapsulating a certain bounded more, context in a way. More or less, we ha don't have to have a, a very strict um, um, boundaries. Uh, there are something that sometimes they talk to each other. Mm -hmm. That's okay in our system because it's a monolith. It's it's not a big thing, especially queries. If you have to get a lot of data, you have to get the email address of a person, and you show the person so and the email is somewhere else, not in the uh, subsystem that most data comes from typically. So you have to gather all the data together. That's why uh, many queries call multiple subsystems. Mm -hmm. Great. And in, a, hmm? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think it's good how like how you're illustrating it, yeah. And to continue this uh, pattern, we divide the subsystem into something we call a slice. Uh, we just don't have a real name, so just, I'm just calling it slice for today. And that's a really thin mm -hmm. uh, slice functionality that does more or less one single thing. Yeah, it reminds me of a like in vertical architecture, where Jimmy Bogart he also uses the word vertical slice. Um, I don't know that. I don't know if, if it's the same, but yeah, it's just something that has most things from top to bottom, but not much functionality in it. It's very. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to say it's single responsibility because this is very difficult. What is a single responsibility? Our whole system has the single responsibility for attendance time tracking. So I find it difficult with this, but it's something yes. that you, we can't split further apart. Mm -hmm. So it's like Maybe an what... atomic uh, uh, way of decomposing functionality. Yeah, if we would split it further, the two parts would, would have to know too much from each other. So the cohesion is too big. Mm -hmm. it, does, it just doesn't feel great if you try to split them up. OK, great. Yeah. Good and explanation. At the end, we need some storage. And we have a system that every slice um, can have its own database or its own schema. We have several database types. You have a re uh, rela relational database. We have uh, blob storage. But it's common that every slice has its own um, database schema, at least. So we can't cross talk with the data in the database. That's very important when we come to the trade of part of our discussion today. Yeah, I, I, that, that one is quite quite interesting. I haven't seen that many. Uh, this one went really, really, how shall I say, decomposed system. Yeah. Um, it makes changes really easy. That's But we will talk about that a bit later, mm -hmm. I think. And to get into the testing aspect, if uh, we write test, I said for the coarse-grained uh, test that we use to drive our business functionality. Um, we call it here, and this tests. Oh, let's show me that on the other side. So it's a little bit less messy. We call a test here. It goes to the to the subsystem, and I went too far because somewhere in here in this slice, there is an interface that allows me to get data from the database or to put data into the database. And uh, I just want to ask, uh, is that kind of like a repository interface? Um, think of it as an interface, a plain C Sharp Java interface mm -hmm. um, that just provides me a method to get some data or a method to put uh, a a person into the database or an address or something. And according to hexagonal architecture, we split between the interface that lives inside the hexagon. That's the one, uh, this one here, and the implementation that is on the outside and that gets injected into the core. And that's, we are working with interfaces. Um, in our C sharp code, in a more OO code. And for the functional part, here we just have a, um, if I spell it correctly, a function signature. And we have a function that implements the signature on the outside. So, but a function or interface in functional, it's more or less the same. It's a, a function is an interface with just one method. Think of it like this. So it's conceptually exactly the same. And that's important in our whole architecture. Um, 
The overall architecture is the same in our oval code and in our functional code. Um, how things are implemented are quite different, but from an architecture point of view, I don't care much whether it's OO or FP. And it's sort of our F sharp code has some OO in it, and our C sharp code has some FP concepts in it. So it's a big uh, merge of all ideas. Wow, that, that's an interesting mix. Now, I have a question before we go into the code samples to illustrate the, the different uh, levels of, of the test. So here you, you've drawn the higher level or coarse grained test whereby we're hitting the user side port or user side API. Yes. So yes, and, the user uh, side goes from the facade mm -hmm. down to the interface or the function signature so that we can uh, inject a fake of the database when we drive with TDD. And inside a slice, we have a lot of small things we call algorithms. Uh, we call something an algorithm if it contains an if statement, a dictionary lookup, uh, a while loop, or in functional so mapping over lists or folding over lists. Or we, if we calculate something with numbers, that's all some kind of algorithm for us. And then typically, to be sure that our code works as expected, we write a test that just tests a single algorithm. So because there, there is the complexity. Um, our software is typically, we, we come from the facade, call a subsystem, and then we chain a couple of algorithms together to produce the result that we need. So if we know that all the algorithms work correctly, uh, we are quite sure that the overall system works as well. And we have one big test that tests the system that all the things are in one way put together. And this way we can eliminate that we have to write a lot of big uh, of these big tests because you have multiple cases. If you have an if, you have two cases to test. And if you have multiple algorithms in a chain that every algorithm has two cases, you have a multiplication of the test cases. So you would end with hundreds of these big scope tests for a single subsystem or a single slide. And that's not maintainable. So we have a lot of small algorithm tests and some uh, big scope tests for driving. But we will continue with this distinguishment, uh, with this uh, good two tests when we go further in our discussion. Uh, yes, uh, now, since, since that part is, is important, and I guess so that people don't miss it further, I, I think this is an excellent example <clears throat> because the kind of system which you're building, it has um, a higher level of complexity versus some other applications whereby maybe use cases are, uh, how shall I say, enough. Because in your case, uh, you did show the example of combinatorial explosion due to all the uh, functions which are being chained together. And as soon as each of those functions has an if statement, that immediately causes multiplication in. Uh, uh, test cases. And before we go on further, I just want to link it up to also some previous meetups, which I had done, which also addressed these points. So use case driven tests, they're the ones which are targeting the facade and okay, for every use case, we can have a use case driven test. But as soon as we have this application with uh, algorithms, then we might need to zoom in and do those more granular tests. Now, in my case, I had a whole heap of use cases which didn't really have algorithms or which maybe had one if in, and no uh, function chaining. So a use case driven test enough was enough. But in one use case, for example, the bank scoring factor uh, it had the bank scoring factor calculation. In that one, I also showed the more granular um, tests. And I really like this visualization which you showed here because it shows the tests a different granularity based on what's optimal in terms of maintainability. 
of the tests. So yes. yeah, a really good drawing. In every slice, we can decide how we want to implement it. Is it a really, really simple slice? So just put this data into the database, just get it back. Mm -hmm. Very, very simple. If there is a lot of validation and rules, the slice is a little bit fatter and uh, we have more concepts in the slice. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I will switch to the code to yes. show you uh, how we write these tests and it's F sharp code. So probably it's a little bit much to, to task digest, but I will try to explain what you see. So F sharp is a more functional program, functional based programming language than C sharp that runs on the .NET platform. But uh, you can also write OO stuff in F sharp. So it makes it really nice if you have a mix. So we have a mixed C sharp, F sharp code base and both can call each other. So historically we started with C sharp and two years ago we switched to F sharp. And this is uh, probably the most extreme example. That's why I show it to you. That this is how we write or how we use TDD nowadays when we start with a new subsystem. So the story of this is we had to re-engineer one subsystem. It's the subsystem that is responsible of uh, modeling how an organization is built. Think like an organization chart. So you have the company, a company consists of the development department and the finance department. And when I started to re-engineer this uh, subsystem, I sat down and thought, so what sh should it do, this subsystem? And I said, the first thing I want to do is I want to create an organization forum, as we call, as we uh, named it. It's uh, the organizational chart. You define it with an organization form. And every test in F sharp, because functional, we don't inject things, except there are functions. So it always starts with our bootstrapper. That's a, a big uh, helper. It's a, a builder, it's a runner that helps us to create our system. So if I write, write this, let bootstrapper create me a new bootstrapper, it actually sets up the whole system with fakes for the database, fakes for the message bus, fakes for everything that is outside of our process. And if the bootstrapper, then I can interact with my system. I can call the facade. And the first thing I do here, I just want to go through it rather quickly, is I set up, these are some helper functions. Ignore them for now. Um, of course, our system has to be secure, so we have to deal with permissions. Let's skip it. So now the first thing I say is, I have this new subsystem and I want to create the form. And it's a time tracking application, so time is always very important. That's why you see a lot of times in our the test code. That's because it's important to us. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, but one other thing just sort of for the audience regarding the word form. So here, organization form in this application means essentially like a company for yes. which we're doing time tracking. You see it here. We have a company. That's the name of the whole organization form. And it consists of two units. You can say it's departments or whatever. Unit is just a more abstract term because not every company has uh, departments. And we have finance and development, for example. Here. So I say I want a company with these two departments uh, from this date, oh, from this date. And this here is the call to our facade. Um, now every subsystem has its own facade, so it, it's easier to navigate our system. So you can see here are all the different subsystems, expenses, organization, tax, tools, activity time, duty planning, and so on. They're all the different subsystems. 
just for na easier to navigate. So I want to create an organization form. So as I execute an operation, now that's a little bit of magic with uh, discriminated unions. If you don't know what that is, just ignore it for now. Just accept that this code is running. I say, I want to execute uh, an operation that creates an organization form with this data here, so that I now have a company with two departments from this data. Um, you see this symbol here, it's actually two characters, just ID combines them together. It's easier to read if you are used to it. That's a pipe. It means I call this operation, I get the result back. And the result says whether the operation was successful or whether there was a uh, typically a validation violation. And I just say, take the output of this function call and pass it to this function. And this function just makes sure that the call was successful, uh, not that we have some business rule validation and that we can't meaningfully continue. And what you see as well is uh, when you learn TDD in the small, you learn one test equals one assert. You see, we do completely the opposite. We have many, many asserts in this single test here. Uh, because it's one of our big scoped tests, that's OK. If it fails, it's important to have a good error message that we find the reason quickly why it failed, so we don't have to debug. And then I get the organization form. That's the helper function we had on top. It goes to the database, to the interface of the database at least, and it queries all events. So our system is event sourced. So what it does, it gets all the events that were stored for this identifier here. It projects all the events into an organization form, then tries to get the latest form. Now, that, that's really complicated, but it's a real world application. And that's uh, what we have to deal with every day is time is difficult. And uh, you probably work in a company that had some changes to its organization structure. So depart a new department or new teams or whatever. And so a company changes over time. So what I say here is project all these events into a timeline. The timeline knows how the company looked at every uh, point in time. And then I say, OK, from this timeline, please give me the newest, the current um, current value how this organization is structured. And because the timeline it is possible that nothing exists, you have to say, um, try to get the value. And again, this here is a kind of pipe operator. So give me all the events, pass all the events to this function, which returns a timeline, pass it to this function to get the current value and try because this returns either I have a value or I don't have a value. That's an option and tries to get the value. And this, uh, we call it the bang here. That's a custom operator from us. So nobody knows what this does. It's just the async pipe. If you don't understand what I just said, ignore it. So. At the end, I get an organization form here. So let's go back here. So I get the current form. And because I just added a new form, I expect it to exist. And I can use this test function and say, the thing that you just got from the database should look like this. So I want to have a company with two departments. So, and then, that was the first thing I wrote, and the, the test ended here, so I could um, create an, uh, a form. And of course, because the code didn't exist, it didn't even compile. I had to make it compile. I implemented uh, some code to make this green. 
And then the next evolution step was, OK, if I have an organization unit, then maybe I can add, If sorry, if I have an organization form, then I want to add a new unit. And it's the same thing again. I have some data, what I want to change. I want to add a unit below finance on this date here. And I call our system and the test that the, if I get the whole organization form, that now I have finance with an additional subunit below it. And then I we implemented this code here to make it green. And so this test wasn't written at once. It was written in many, many steps. And when I, I don't remember, in one step, finally I said, yeah, but that's a little bit complicated. That's not just straightforward. So maybe I have to write a smaller scope test because now I have something algorithmic in it. And let me take a look at my notes. Yes. Um, for example, if we want to add an organization unit and say, add this one to this, we first have to make sure that this unit exists, otherwise it's a, a validation error. And that's something algorithmic. So I wrote a smaller test, an al a, a test around an algorithm. This one here, actually, we start with the second one because that's the more meaningful one. Um, I say, given I have a form, when I call this try find organization unit, please find me development, I should get a result because I have a form with this development here. It should return the, the unit that is created here. So it, that's a typical TDD-like test. I have a setup, an arrange, I have an act, and I have an assert. So that's really by the book. And the function I test is really small. It's just this little function here. So it traverses the, the tree of units in the organizational chart. And if it finds the one I'm looking for, it just returns the, sub, uh, the branch in the tree of this organization. We have really, really small tests around such small algorithm, algorithmic parts, and you have this really, really big test. And what we, what we find out for us is these really big tests here. They are really great to drive development. So I just have, yeah, somehow I want to create an organizational form. Let me just write down how I would like to call it and how I would like to check if it. Work. So that's the facade of our core. And if I feel that I would have to add a second big test because there is an if in the code somewhere and I have the feeling I should test that, then I say I extract this code into an algorithm and write the test just around the algorithm. I think that that's a really interesting summary of how you explained your starting off with these wider scope tests. And you mentioned you don't write the test <clears throat> all at once. You, you do you do the test increase. So you might have a bit of the test, write some code, and then go further and further. And then you reach a point where, where you're in the big test and you realize you would have to write another big test just for like a single if. And you realize you've gotten to the algorithmic part. And that's when you extract that part of the code and then you write the test for that algorithm, you make the algorithm work and then you continue back to that uh, bigger scope uh, test. Yes, exactly, yes. Okay, so I, th I think that this was a pretty good um, overview uh, regarding our code samples for the first part about use case uh, versus algorithm tests. 
So I guess unless there was something else which you wanted to show here, um, the next section was about the discussion about coverage. Yeah. So I think we I can return if there are questions about this, but I think we should continue with the. Uh, yes, yes. So everyone feel free to add questions. Now, this is a unique opportunity. The fact that we're seeing production code and not cutters like on most meetups. So feel free to, um, you know, uh, mention any questions in the chat. Okay, so the whole topic regarding uh, coverage, could you maybe tell us about why 100% coverage and zero bugs are the wrong goals in your perspective and what you see as the right way of, um, you know, looking yes. at the targets? Um, we live in a context with our application where no human life depends on whether the system is running and that's very important so if our system is down for a couple of minutes or an hour it's really not a big deal if it's offline for multiple days yeah then it get we have unhappy customers and one thing is because we have that many slices so if we have a bug in one slice all other slices still uh, are functional and working. So um, if you have one slice that calculates something wrong, you have a very a bug that is very located in a small place. Uh, we can't have one bug tear down the whole system. Uh, there is one exception. If we idle, uh, if we put CPU to 100%, then it's a problem for the whole system. We had that once, but in seven years, just once, it's OK. And yeah, that's a whole story for itself. What was the cause of that? And um, so what we optimize for is happy customers and custom solving problems that our customers have. So if they need a feature from our, our software because they have a special case or something, we want to implement the solution as quickly as possible in a decent quality so it should run and we should have to trust in our code that it very likely is running correctly but we don't need uh, absolute uh, trust that it is absolutely correct because uh, we optimize for that if there is a bug that we can quickly recover from the bug and event sourcing is one part because we have the whole history. If something is wrong, we can replay the whole history, every change that was made. We don't lose data because we only append data in our database for most parts. And um, we just write enough tests that we think that I'm sure, yes, it's really like really likely that it will work. And typically it needs way less than 100% test coverage to get to this point. And one important thing is that in our C-sharp code, the test coverage is much higher than in our F-sharp code, because in F-sharp, the, the compiler sometimes is a real pain because it said, yeah, but that, that won't work, and that won't work, and that won't work. And once it compiles, it's if you just combine like Lego bricks, all the algorithms together, if it compiles, it's very likely to be correct anyway. Uh, we don't have that feeling in C-sharp. So we have in C-sharp a higher test coverage than in F-sharp. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So what you're saying is that due to, I guess, some of the unique benefits regarding F-sharp as a language and the static uh, typing, which would have been maybe normally covered by a test in another language here in F-sharp, you're not uh, covering it. Uh, yes, because the, the type system of F-sharp allows us to model our domain much closer to the real world than C-sharp allows us, because you have more opportunities. You have, as I said earlier, you have discriminated units. You can say uh, this value is either this or it is this other thing, but it can't be anything else. In C-sharp, we always have to use interfaces, and interfaces are open hierarchies you can always add a new implementation of an interface 
discriminated unions are a closed hierarchy. You say, okay, you can have A or you can have B. You can't add anything. So it's closed. And that makes it much easier for the compiler to check that you actually really only have A's and B's and no C's. And with interfaces, you can't do that. So we lose a lot of pattern matching in F sharp, which makes coding, um, in my opinion, much easier than working with interfaces. So, and yeah. The, but of course, you have to get used to this, this style first before you uh, get the feeling that it really helps you. That's for sure. Uh, exactly. And I have a question again, coming back to uh, coverage. Uh, assuming to the uh, assuming the fact that you're already, I mean, driving development with test-driven development, and you're starting off with those, I mean, wider scope tests, and also doing those smaller scope tests, then that means everything that's within the core and the application, you would then naturally get high coverage without trying or is there some code which was for example written without tdd which would cause the lower yes coverage? The, the we looked at the code for at the test for system do something for me uh, create a new organizational form so they are typically have quite a high test coverage just because we start with this big scope test and if there is some algorithm part, it will test it with an algorithm. So coverage there is may, probably close to 100% just because we work this way. On the other side, queries. So system, give me some data. And we, because we have this much slices, we have a lot of queries. And we combine partial queries together to big queries. And uh, there are could be many, many, many tests for all different kinds of data. And there the test coverage is much lower. But uh, yeah, I can show you a bit of code. So you, it probably makes it easier to understand. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that part that you mentioned, I found a similar case also in my projects. I mean, the whole difference between the right side versus the query side. And quite often in the query side, the database is also doing, might be doing some logic as well, or? Yes, that's a, an additional topic, yeah, that typically we query data from the database. So we have the, the where clauses in the database that have to be correct. And that's something different. You can maybe talk later that we can run our system either with our fake, in-memory fake of the database or the real database locally and in the uh, CI in the CI pipeline. Mm -hmm. And that helps a lot to make sure that the queries are actually correct. Yeah. And on the topic of fakes, uh, maybe also in your code demo, uh, perhaps if you could show us uh, some fakes, because that was a question which came up in nearly every uh, meetup. What do fakes look like? Fake of the database. Yes. Fakes of database, uh, if, if yeah, those are the sure. ones you have. Um, let me quickly search the correct one. Mm -hmm. So, um, this is the storage of the, the, the code that allows me to access data about an organization form. So query data or persist data. And we use uh, an interface. So it's F sharp using an interface um, with a method to persist data, persist events. And then you have several ways to query these events from the store. It's typically, um, do I already know the ID of the form or I know the ID of a unit or some variation, uh, what I have to get the correct data. And we have two implementations of this interface. One is the in-memory storage. That's our fake. Um, that's some fancy F-sharp syntax. I say, OK, I don't want a class that implements this interface. I just want an object that implements this interface. And that's the, uh, you can get this in F-sharp with this syntax. So that's the interface. Just say, give me an object for that interface. And here are the implementations of the methods. So um, our fake just uses 
uh, an in-memory list of the events. So we have here a list, that's a list of these events. Uh, we store some additional data because um, in our system, if something goes wrong, we don't have transactions that span all the things because transactions that span all the things make uh, the architecture much more complex. So every slice has its own transaction. And if something goes wrong, we and we talk to multiple slices, we have to compensate what we already did. And this year is, if there is data here, we know this event was compensated and should be ignored in further queries or in future queries. So the fake is just a list of objects or a list of records. And if you look at the query, let's say, give me all the events you have. I just take this list. I filter out all the ones that we should ignore because they were compensated. I put it in a nice container that makes uh, it easier to handle them in the business logic code. And that is just saying, oops, um, handle that as an async result. Because the in-memory is obvious synchronous code. There is no DB call. So we just put it in an asynchronous return value. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I also have a question regarding the parts above. So, so we're still in the fake. And here, as far as I can see within this fake, we can see uh, quite a realistic simulation of the, the like as in the fake has, has logic. It's simulating uh, yes, the, it, the, the it, database very, very closely. Yeah. For example, if you have, if I search for all the events of a specific form, I, of course, have the where statement. And the where statement with list is a list filter. So filter, take only the events that satisfy, satisfy uh, this condition here. So that's and actually the, the where statement. Uh, how about the part where, let's say, the database would normally join something, maybe join some tables? Yeah. Luckily, I have an example here. Just right, you have an example for nearly yeah. everything all, all in one file. <laughs> yeah, files get a bit bigger in F sharp, but that's actually no problem. So here I have in this fake and in the real database, you have two tables. I have the event table and I have a helper table uh, that helps me answer some queries. And a join between those tables. Um, is something like this. I get this helper table, and because I have a unit ID here, I have to first to find out which to which form this unit belongs. And this helper table is just a mapping. You see it here from unit ID to form ID. So that's a tuple. This, the story means it's a tuple. And so I get from all these uh, entries here, I get the one for the unit I'm looking for. And then I say, OK, just take the second part. That's the scripting function here. Take the second part of the tuple, which is the form, and make it distinct, just for safety reasons here, because it's just a fake and we don't care. And there should be exactly one element in this list. Otherwise, we have an exception. Yeah, I think that this, this is a great I mean, example in how we're seeing real life uh, code and all the complexities of real life development. Another question, again, because test doubles is a really popular uh, uh, question. Uh, I know at the beginning how you mentioned you made even the mocking library. Well, how did you personally make the decision, for example, to use fakes rather than stubs or uh, mocks, for example, for the uh, storage? Yeah, it's, first, you have to talk about the terms, mocks and stops and spies and fakes and test doubles. So a mock, as far I, as I understand it is, in a mock, the logic where whether it was successful is inside the mock. Yes, so it's, the not mock inside my, it's, not, it's not inside my test code. It's inside the mock as I mock, verify whether all was well. 
And a spy is just um, a spy can say me this function was called, or this method was called with this argument. And in, I can say if that should happen, if I have an interaction based test, I can say in my test code, hey, spy, uh, give me all your calls and there should be this one, this specific call should be called. That's a spy. Uh, a fake is a no, is a more abstract term for everything, as is test double. And we often also use, typically I say, we have a simulation of the database. So just to put in another word for the same thing. Uh, yes, I mean, the, I guess the core difference to emphasize is that a fake, it actually has logic. It's like a simulator. Whereas yes. with stubs, we actually give it some hard-coded uh, Yes, uh, if data. you call, if someone calls this, then do this. That's, uh, I would say that's a, fa uh, that's a, I don't know, all the libraries mix these terms together. It's really hard. And the yeah. stop, I would say, a stop is just there. It can call it. It does nothing. That's for me a stop. Mm -hmm. But typically, yeah. it's not that, I think it's not that important, um, except don't use mocks, because mocks make the test code really hard to read, because you don't see in the test what you actually are testing. You just say mock, do your thing, and you have to go to the mock and see what it really does, check. So don't use mocks. And I know there are mocking libraries that actually return fakes, so it's a big mess. Or mocking libraries, where it's like you're actually working with stubs, but then people get confused with the terminology. And another also benefit here that I can see is since you're using a fake storage, which has essentially, it's simulating the database, then later you can also swap this out with the real uh, database. I think you mentioned that on some LinkedIn post, how you're able to yes. use the same test, both with fakes and with the real database. It's really simple. If I want to run the tests in this, um, where is it? In this assembly here, I just have to remove this underscore. And now we have a, a connection string. And the bootstrapper I showed, the first example mm -hmm. uh, looks for a connection string called testing. If it found, if it finds one, it imp, uh, it takes the implementation for the real database, and the tests are run against the real database. So that's why normally it's like this, and it doesn't find the connection string, and then it runs the in-memory simulation. Okay, that's all the uh, magic there so is that's a nice, uh, I mean, how you mentioned the bootstrap, it, it does definitely reduce the amount of uh, test code. Uh, how do you handle then, I mean, when you run it with the real database, the uh, isolation, like are the tests run uh, all against database, or do you use... Um, yes, uh, there's two things. Yeah, there are two things. Uh, crosstalk, we don't, we don't want crosstalk between different tests. And we don't, we have to deal with the state. So if it's an in-memory simulation, the state, if you run, if the test run is done, the data is gone. That's a good thing for the next run. We don't have old data. And with the real database, our system is a, a tenant-based system. So every customer gets its own tenant ID. And we use that when we run all the tests, every test gets another tenant ID. So they are all running on the same database, but every test has its own tenant ID. And the database, the real one, makes sure that a tenant sees only its, only, uh, its own data. It's overall level security. Okay. So if you write the test, the test gets a tenant ID assigned puts data with the tenant ID into the database. And when it's querying data, it just gets the data for this tenant ID back. So we can use this feature makes, we have to set up the database once, we can run all the tests, then you have to reset the database. And that's much quicker than doing, for, doing it for every test. So that would be much too slow. We have too many tests for that. And that's a nice trick to make the tests run fast, even with the real database. The funny thing is the real database is almost exactly 
the same speed as the in-memory database. So really, we really suck at implementing an in-memory database, but it's fast enough. And um, yeah, and it's also a good test that the tenant ID row level security actually works as we expected, because if tests fail with uh, strange date, we know the tenant ID doesn't really work. So, so you, you get an additional benefit. Yeah, yeah. but um, we are anyway, anyway, we are sure that it works, but it would be a second safety net if one of these tests would fail. Mm -hmm. so. uh, I just want to add here, I think uh, one of Dave Farley's YouTube videos, he also explained this possibility regarding uh, isolation through, through data isolation, because here you're actually able to run uh, tests with the real database in isolation uh, yeah. due to the um, uh, tenants. This allows us also to run tests in production on test tenants. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and one more question, which I think is also, we will shortly also cover the part at the end, but uh, how about time? Do you have any test doubles for uh, the clock or any of that? Oh, <laughs> okay. Three minutes and four, 20, uh, 40 seconds. Um, time is really difficult in our system because everything depends on time in our system. And as you have seen in the, if you can switch to the code here, um, we pass a lot of times into our system. For example, here I pass in when this operation is happening. So we always pass when is what means now to the facade. That's the job of the web app, uh, the web API. The web API takes the real time and passes this passes it into the hexagon into our facade. So inside our core business logic, we never get the time from the time provider. It, it always has to be passed in. Okay, so here what's happening is that the time is being passed essentially through the request which is coming in through the facade yeah. and this is why there is no need yeah. for uh, a clock interface which is what someone would do when they're uh, getting the time from inside. We have, okay. a clock, we have a clock interface in our web API because mm -hmm. um, we found out that nodes in Azure don't have the same time. So, and we have our own synchronization mechanism with the official time servers that we are in some milliseconds difference at most. It's because that if you, every request goes to another node and you have Different times that can be apart by several minutes, it just messes up your data because it's event sourced and suddenly you have the wrong order of events because you went to a node that has an earlier time than the one that you went to just before. So we had to write our own mechanism to make sure that timing is correct. Wow, the, it's really for the test code, we always pass in the time. But maybe that's a little bit special in our system because we deal with time. So that's really, really important. Otherwise, maybe a fake of the time provider is good enough. Yes, it's, it's good to see. I mean, the, these two possibilities. Okay, now we will be getting to the questions in a few minutes. There are quite a lot of questions. Uh, but the last part was, and maybe we could, I guess, do a quicker version of it uh, regarding how architecture influences the TDD approach. So um, I think you mentioned here about showing the core solution folder organization. So this whole thing that people can see the API and uh, the adapters. So maybe we could do just a short overview of, of that part. Um, I, now I didn't get what you want me to show, but uh, I can yeah. say that the main architectural thing is that we have all these slices and, um, and uh, Doc can't escape his own slice. So we can't introduce very dramatic errors in our system. 
Mm -hmm. Could you maybe open it on the left hand side or something so that we can see the window uh, and how the functions are organized? And this was also a question which came up in the GitHub community. So maybe to show a bit high level uh, your structure, like where's the okay. core, where are the subsystems, where are the uh, adapters? In other words, how are you organizing mm -hmm. your so work? We, mm -hmm. we have solution for all this. This is the web API. There are a couple of projects in it. And here is the core. And here are the, the several subsystems. So uh, we have some history and the core, that's all the C-sharp subsystems. And with F-sharp, we, uh, we thought that it would be better to split these subsystems really out in their own assemblies. So we have different subsystems and that's project time. We just call it differently. That's the duty planning, the scheduling, we have expenses, we have some mail notification stuff. And that's the one I was always talking about, organization and two other subsystems, tags and tools. And inside such a slice, such a subsystem, I have the actually the part for the web API that gets included in the overall web API. That's a nice feature of ASP.NET that you can split the API onto multiple uh, assemblies. So it just keeps the things together. It's easier to navigate in the solution here. Then you have the production code and you have the, all the tests, the big tests and small tests against this subsystem. And inside this organization subsystem, I have two slices. I have organization forms where I can define how the organization looks like uh, with all the departments and teams and so on, locations. And I have the other slice, it's assignment. That means I'm working in the development department since two years. So it's we assign people to units in a specific role. We have members, we have leaders, we have HR people, and so on. So these are the two slices. And in a slice, we typically have um, some types. These are the types here that model uh, our domain. So this is a unit, this is form. A form consists of units, not surprisingly. And for every type in here, most of the times we have a corresponding module. This is an F-sharp module, not a conceptual module. And uh, the organization form module contains all the functions that I can apply on an organization form. So it doesn't have to be this way, but that's how we organize, organize our stuff most of the times. All the functions inside the organization form module take in some way an organization form, typically as its last argument, so that we can pipe the functions together. So and here are all the functions. To find an organization, you need add something, remove, and so on, so on. So this is all, all the functions uh, in here. The same goes for assignments. I have, so this assignment means some employee is working in a unit in a role. I have the types here to model our domain. And then so here, again, a module that contains the functions to operate on this assignment. Yeah, I think that's probably it. Uh, so great. And uh, sorry. Away. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, the adapters, where are they located? Like, uh, I mean, the real database ORM stuff. We have the, the facade, that's the one to get into this subsystem. Mm -hmm. That's this one here. Um, again, we use a class because we have to call that sometimes from the C-sharp code. It's easier to work with classes here. Um, we also use a constructor injection here to get the, the things we need for the subsystem to talk with uh, other subsystems or to talk with, for example, the database. Um, that's our facade. We also have another facade 
This one is here when subsystems talk uh, horizontally with each other. So I see here all the other subsystems need this functionality in here to make uh, to work correctly because some subsystems need to know all the people that are working in a specific unit and they can call a function here. And at least this is how we create the storage. Here again, you see we have a function to create the storage. And if this context uh, is there, that means we have a uh, we have a connection string. We call the SQL implementation. Otherwise, we use the in-memory implementation. So that's wow. actually the three things we need to get into this subsystem. Well, these two to get into the subsystem, that's the outgoing port to access the database. Mm -hmm. OK, great. So now I think we've seen everything. So we've seen the presentation layer. So those uh, controllers, which you mentioned, were able to be split. Uh, and we also looked at the functional slices, which is where you have all your uh, business logic. And then we also looked at the uh, adapters and we saw how this whole thing, how you're um, applying hexagonal architecture and functional programming. So I guess uh, this is the end of our first part, the session. So now we can get to onto the questions. Now, since there are quite a lot of questions, I would recommend maybe one minute or maximum two minutes per question just so that we can cover more ground. And then if there's time left over, which there probably won't be, then we can go into more uh, detail. So now I will just switch back to this view. OK, so starting from the uh, start. So is there a one-to-one -one mapping between the facade methods and the API? Most of the times, yes, but there are exceptions. Mm -hmm. Because we, we own our own client, so we just write it for our client. So it's mostly a one-to-one, -one, yes. Yes, and I guess this question with the word, I mean, API, I'm assuming here it's referring to the user side API mm -hmm. of, of the hexagonal architecture. We, we also have a public API. You can call, other systems can call us, and they call the same uh, core functionality so yeah yeah the, the same i mean the user side api is used both it's being called by the web controller and also by the tests okay by those uh, higher level wider scope tests okay what's the criteria to create or update a new uh subsystem so maybe perhaps how do you know whether you're going to put some functionality into an existing subsystem or create a new one um i would say we do that for all the things for subsystems for slices for modules if something grows too big and we can't understand it anymore we split it up but you always have to remember that if you split something up into two parts you have three problems the individual parts how to solve them and how you integrate them so splitting up has somewhere its limit, where splitting up is, gets you a more complicated system than having it together. But most of the time, is, if it gets too big, we split it up. And there are some subsystems that we just naturally knew that, yeah, I think that's a good idea to put it in a new subsystem, like the duty planning thing, because it's quite different from the rest. So we started with directly with a new subsystem. Mm -hmm. but otherwise, yeah. if you can fix, split up. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Uh, slice is use case, I think. Uh, maybe this is related to our previous discussion. What, what is a slice? And when you mentioned that there are, to me, a slice, slice is really atomic and granular. A slice provides multiple use cases. But in our case, we model very, very small use cases. For example, change the email address of a person is its own use case as is change the name. These are individual use cases. We don't have a person with email and address and everything. Every little data uh, has its own use case, but all changing email, changing address is in the same slice. 
and this all we hold the data together with the employee ID. So we have an ID and an email. We have a, the same ID with an address, and so on. So it's really, really, really small. This slice, uh, this, uh, yeah. Uh, so just to check if, if no, I understood. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the slices are really, really small. Sometimes it's a single use case, but not always. That's probably the correct mm -hmm. one. Uh, so this means if we had, for example, uh, change the user's name versus change the email, those would be, for example, two separate slices. And one yeah. slice would have access to the data about the name, the other one uh, to the email. But in the organization form example, you can change the organization form, you can add a unit, you can move a unit around, that's in the same slice because they are so close together, we can't split that up. Because it, maybe you can say, if it ends in the same event stream, it has to be in the same slice. Mm -hmm. in, in event source speak. If you have the same stream of events, it has to go in the same thing, it has to be in the same slice with our architecture. Okay. Uh, the next question, do these tests require the use of a debugger sometimes and how often? Um, yes, because they test a lot of stuff. So as a, the functional tests, no, I don't use the debugger. Re really, no, from time to time, but mostly not. Uh, this big test, yeah, from time to time, I use the debugger. Um, but the tests normally tell me exactly what is wrong because some nice thing is uh, if you can shortly switch to the code. Uh, yes. Um, this test here, uh, if I test for equality and it isn't equal, uh, I probably just show it. Um, it will put me out, uh, it will give me a diff between the left and the right side. So I see exactly what is wrong. And most of the time, this is good enough. And if this is not good enough with us, most of the times I use a debugger is when times, time instances are off. Why is there the wrong time instance? That is really hard to get in the test output. Then I use a debugger. So now I have a lot of windows here. Uh, I know it's, uh, it's quite big. It says, yeah, the label is off. And down here is, I see the whole thing on the left, JSON-like, and the whole thing on the right. So it's a very detailed exception message. Um, it also contains the correct names of the variables, it's the same as I have here. So uh, here. So it's really detailed. So. Most of the times it's good enough to see what is wrong. But sometimes, yeah, we use the debugger, no big deal. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I guess we can then go on to the next question. Uh, what kind of fakes is the bootstrap creating? And if you ever need to manipulate these fakes, for example, returning specific hard coded values, for example, how is it done? Now, I think this part of the question uh you had already uh, shown it uh, you had shown how we uh, the bootstrapper can either create i mean the the real implementations uh, instantiate the real adapters for example for the database versus the uh fakes so that first part was shown previously in the video but the second one if you ever need to manipulate these fakes returning hard-coded values, that was actually the discussion regarding fakes versus stubs, I believe, because returning specific hard-coded values is what would be done if we're setting up uh, stubs, as far as I know. I have one other example of a fake here. It's a mm -hmm. fake for our service bus. So when we run our system locally or in the test, we don't use the real Azure service bus but we want to be able to run our system locally. And um, 
This one here is just for the tests. It just stores all the messages that were sent in a, a list, and you can query this list whether the message you expected is there. So it's the same concept as with the database fakes just for the service bus. And then we have some fakes that or simulators that simulate the service bus. And unluckily, I can't remember how it's called. It's service bus sender, maybe. So that's some C sharp code. And let's see what happens in here. That's the wrong one. Is it the right one? Yeah, what it does, it, it's a little bit hard code to understand, but um, we have a sender, message sender, that implements this function and sends a message to the bus. And we have a handler in the real code that would handle this message and call this code. So this fake just uh, makes a shortcut here. When you call this method, I synchronously call the handler code. So it just may just a short circuit um, fake to keep everything synchronous. That's a nice feature because if it's synchronous, if you have to debug, it's way easier to debug than when this message calls would be asynchronous. Uh, thanks for adding this example as well, um, because messaging is definitely another uh, challenge. So it's great how you've shown the, the fake here as well. And just to get back to this question uh, regarding returning hard-coded values, I mean, that's something which, which I do if I'm using stubs but not for fakes because in fakes the fake has all the all the logic you're not manipulating the fake in in any way it's the system is behaving the same as if you're using the real database you're you're not I doing don't think, i don't think we set up fakes to return a specific value because there are always more simulations in our system so if i want to get data from the database i have to add it to the database Correct. So the fake stores that and returns it again. Here I have to send a message so I can execute it. So there's no setup of a fake. We have some of these tests. We have some dedicated tests against the web API. And there we fake the facade with a faking library for some tests. So to really make sure that uh, because sometimes there is code in the web API in the adapter to make the correct calls or to combine some results, mostly when security is involved. And sometimes we have specs there and they use a, a fake library to set up. If you call this, return this data. Maybe I can yeah, share. that's the one where you're using, I mean, uh, you're probably stubbing or, or mo mocking there. Uh, those would be the, I mean, the adapter integration tests because in there you're testing the web API, but you're essentially mocking the uh, hexagon. Let's see if I find one. Here is a, you have a, a f this factor here is to create fakes. And I can say, okay, if I, I expect that someone calls this method with this data. So must have happened means I, it checks that this call was made. Mm -hmm. OK. And this is a uh, fake it easy. It's called this library we are using here. Yes. And again, back back, back to the names, it's, it's, it's probably a mocking. Uh, library doing mocks because must have happened it's, yes it's doing verification okay uh great i guess we can move on to the next question so how often do you write fine-grained tests those algorithm tests or maybe which proportion of your tests is another related question are the algorithm <laughs> And I think this is maybe a similar question that I also asked you somewhere on LinkedIn. Um, it's hard to say, but if the subsystem is really, really simple, we don't have much algorithm tests. We just have this coarse grain tests. Um, but if, for example, in our accounting uh, 
subsystem where we crunch all the numbers together, there are many, many, many tests to make sure that the calculations are correct. So there are way more algorithm tests than this uh, big scope tests. So it really depends on the subsystem. But if I write an if or a, a loop or a fault, most of the times I tend to write an, al an algorithm test for it just to make sure it runs correct. Mm -hmm. okay. Sometimes it's the, oh, I did that time, already time t uh, 10 times. I'm sure it works. Then I skip the test. And sometimes the bug haunts me afterwards because it wasn't the same thing, but that, that happens. It's always a trade off um, between what, what is the cost of writing the test and what is the benefit? The cost is also I have to write it, I have to maintain it, um, I have to update it if it changes something in the architecture sometimes. I have to change it when the facade changes, happens not so often, but happens. And the plus side is, I, yeah, it helps me drive if I need driving. For example, for algorithms, I often don't need driving. I know how to write it. And um, it is a regression test. And again, regression test, how likely is it to, that this code will change in a way that could introduce a bug? And again, in F-sharp, this is much harder than in C-sharp. So we don't write less tests again in F-sharp for that. So yeah, it, it's always difficult to, to make this trade-off uh, in the best possible way. And one funny thing is that in our C sharp code, if I want to know uh, how does that work, I will always go and look at the test. In the F sharp code, I always go in the production code because the production code is so much easier than the test code in F sharp and it's vice versa in C sharp code. There is the production code is much harder to read than the test code. That's a funny thing. That's a really interesting observation. And we also had a follow-up question, which was essentially already, I mean, answered by your previous response, which is that ratio that it actually varies based on the yeah. uh, subsystem. And in your case, the subsystem is modeling a certain bounded co uh, context. So what's the complexity of it? it? Does it have maybe low algorithmic complexity or higher, which could affect the, the ratio? Another question is, do you use property-based testing? Uh, currently, no. The reason is we we don't have algorithms that at least we are not capable to do it to write good properties for it. It's I think our algorithms are, are better with examples. But I'm really no expert in property-based testing, so there is probably a potential to use it but uh, yeah we don't do it mm -hmm, great uh, the next one do you have integration tests from the api to the database if not why not and and have you felt the need of having them um, we can run our business logic test with the database as i've shown so we have the integration there we also sometimes have dedicated tests against queries for for the complex queries that just call the DB access code. And they run against the in-memory and they run the real thing, of course. And we have some tests that call just the API part, but we don't have tests that go through API, through business log to the database. And we never miss that. Uh, but I have to mention that we have some additional kinds of tests, like uh, we are capable to find all the types that we pass or get from the client. That's some magic uh, reflection code that goes through all the controllers in our system, gets all the types that are communicated to the client and from the client. And we have tests that make sure that they can be chased and serialized and deserialized. That's a very important test for us. It also makes sure that it can't change a type in the backend and the client gets incompatible because we changed the name of a property. The test would fail to say, yeah, these are uh, snapshot tests. So we have a 
Jason that said this, it should be like this. And if it finds a difference, you say, hey, you made a difference. It should look like this. Mm -hmm. And so we split up all this in very dedicated serialization tests and so on. So we don't need this uh, integration from API to DB or even from client to DB. So we never talked about the client. We don't have a single test on the client. Uh, yes, uh, and no big problem. Uh, Our client uh, is really thin, really dumb, so that's why it's working. Is it like a uh, wait? You mentioned it was like a small, some Angular uh, application. Yeah. And most things on the client that are wrong are visually you can't see something, or and you can't test that with an automated test. So I would say the better trade off for us is to invest a little bit more in testing it manually, uh, if the client looks great, uh, if it really, how does it feel? How is the response? Uh, all of the things that are, you can't test with an automated test in a good way, in an easy way. Um, and But all the data is already correct from the database. So we tend to put algorithm stuff always to the, to the back end, so we can test it there. Uh, that, that's great. So you get really high testability on the backend side. And also, I want to add one more point again regarding these questions. This question, since we're using the hexagonal architecture, we uh, would either minimize, I mean, these kind of tests, ABI, API to database, simply because on one hand, we have the unit tests, which are targeting the uh, hexagon either the boundary of the hexagon or uh, here as was shown algorithms inside the hexagon. So we have unit tests there. Then we have those adapter tests, which you mentioned for the controllers and we mock out the hexagon. Uh, and you also have some dedicated tests for the driven adapters when you're testing the queries and that's pretty much that's all needed. And this minimizes the need for uh, yes. doing the tests which span the whole API. To database. We, we always ask ourselves, how confident are, am I that the code is correct? And I say, yeah, I think it's correct, then enough tests written. Mm -hmm. Because there's also yeah. compile time and everything that adds up if you have thousands over thousands of tests. So even if you have a modularized system with all the facade and tests are decoupled for implementation, still there is some maintenance to be done because you learn how to write better tests and then you ask yourself, yeah, should I rewrite this old test to match the new concept? Because otherwise in a couple of years, you won't understand your tests anymore. So it just adds up all these small things. So uh, we like to write tests if we think they are really valuable. Otherwise we just leave them out. Again, exactly. our context, no human lives depend on the system. Great. Okay, um, we have maybe several more questions. So let, let's see if we try, I guess, uh, uh, shortening. I think we might be able to fit it in the next several minutes, but it's great how everyone had so many questions. How often do you deploy? Uh, every time a feature is finished, from several times a day to two weeks, no new feature. So. We just we take one problem of a user and solve the problem, and if it's solved, you deploy it whenever that happens. Mm -hmm. So uh, essentially, providing some value to the user. Yes, it should provide some value to the user. Yes, or at least to us. Sometimes new features we deploy them just for test accounts, so we can test them in the live system. Uh, real users can't see them. Mm -hmm. Some feature problem. Okay. Uh, any book or reading recommendations which go in the same test-driven development strategy as you do? I relate them with the gears principle from Kent Beck. That's the one where, okay, we have a high-level test and then we zoom into and maybe do lower-level tests to help us implementation. But is there any other literature? There's a lot of good literature, but literature, but none describes the way we work. So this classic TD by example from Kent Beck is really great, uh, especially if you read it, reread it over a couple of years. So, oh, that's already in there. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
growing object oriented systems guided by tests, I think. But I don't like the faking in there. It's just too much faking in there. That's but, the one, yeah, with the mocks for new yeah, model but it's, it, it describes the outside in approach really nicely. But we don't write the mock for the thing in there. We just keep it simply, it just returns a hard coded number at the beginning, or it's really small. And if it gets bigger, we say we put it in a slice, see if you have to write algorithmic tests. So we never use mocks for that like they describe in the book. And there is The Art of Unit Testing, Roy Osharoff. That's also a great book. Um, yeah, our approach is a mix of all that adapted to our own way of working. Uh, maybe I have a word to describe the approach because I was thinking about this uh, problem for like months, mm -hmm. what's the name? Uh, I would call it uh, classicist TDD because you're applying test doubles only at the architectural boundary. So, for example, for repository and for messages, and you're not like mocking out all the collaborators for, for everything. So it belongs to classicist TDD uh, in an outside-in way, uh, simply because, okay, classicist in someone could, could start it inside out, like from a small class and then go out, or they could do... Uh, outside in. So I, I would call it, even though this word is not official anywhere, <laughs> but uh, let, let's invent a new word, uh, outside in, classes as TDD. Of course, if anyone has a better terminology, feel free to let us know. Yeah, and probably the best literature is the, the book that you are going to write, Valentina, in, a, in some months or years. Uh, yes, I was actually thinking of uh, citing you in some future um, article. Uh, I, I do want to clarify this thing because the approach uh, which you described is pretty much uh, what I'm doing. So I have those uh, use case uh, tests, which you called here the higher level tests. Um, then uh, at times you mentioned when you have algorithms you end up writing the algorithm tests. And that's something which I also showed in a previous meetup. So if I had the, the bank scoring you know, algorithm, I would write lower level tests targeting that because it has like maybe 50 factors and each of them has its own logic mm -hmm. and that's combinatorial uh, explosion. Okay, the only difference which I found now was, okay, in your overview, you mentioned as soon as you see an if or a loop, you did go straight to the algorithm test whereas in my case if i can do that for a use case test like in the uh, banking withdrawal account i tested those two cases if it was an if but i tested it for, for the use case so i how shall i say mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, um more of my tests are use case driven tests yeah. and but i do use algorithms where i see like complexity but you maybe have a bit more the, of the reason for, the reason for that is probably that your use case is because you have a, an example application or rather small and then it's okay because the use cases just get too big you have to set up too much data you don't want to duplicate these uh, use case tests in in our system so, uh, your your one is you algorithmically complex, so it is good that we had this example. Now, uh, the example which I showed in the kata, it was not just in the kata, but even in the real world. But the reason was because I was working in uh, applications like order processing or those business ones where there was not that much calculations. So it was true that a lot of it could be covered with use case driven tests, but there was one exception. When I worked on, on an appli some applications which involved more mathematics, banking or cryptography in those ones, I had so many low level uh, tests. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I, I might reference you somewhere in some future writing. But try uh, both ways, take what is better. So. Exactly. No, no to it. Yeah. Now, if you had a uh, if you have a regression, I think regression bug, would you add the test as an algorithm or as a use case? With the smallest test scope exactly. possible. With a test with the smallest scope possible. If I can uh, simulate it in an algorithm test, I do it there. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. E, uh, I think, okay, that, that was the same one as above. Then we also have Mikhail, thanks for joining. Yeah, Mikhail for joining. Um, so fakes are production, stops, mocks are for testing, isn't the case here. Now, I think here he's talking about uh, uh, the approach which he uses, uh, which is also described on LinkedIn. I think Mikhail uses more stops and mocks in the test, so he doesn't use these simulator like fakes in uh, uh, tests. So I think that's that's an example of, yeah. I guess, a bit of a difference in approach. A, we don't have a testing staging environment where we simulate the surrounding systems that don't belong to us. We don't have this. We have it the system locally or in the pipeline ad hoc or the real system. So we don't distinguish between uh, these different stages where you have different kinds of test doubles. Uh, yeah, you, you just have one category of fakes. You don't have like yeah. real, real fake versus not so real fake. You just have... Yeah. But sometimes um, the distinguish, uh, distinction is useful when you have a testing staging environment and you have to simulate an, an, another system that you talk to and you want to get some data from that. We don't have that at the moment. So that's why we just use one way mm -hmm. oh, in my case even when i had a system where i would later maybe for staging environment do a simulation of it i would actually use the same fake that i had the only difference is i would maybe fill it up with some data in setup so i actually didn't have a need for a new fake mm -hmm. uh the next question did you start with a CQRS event sourcing architecture or did you migrate from a CRUD system if the latter how difficult was it to adapt your tests or your system? Um, we did start event sourced. Not all the system is event sourced. There is some CRUD in this system, of course. We don't do everything event sourced. Uh, CQRS, we don't actually do CQRS by the book. Um, a lot of times we just project all the events if we need a projection. It's rather fast. Sometimes we introduce read models if this projection is too slow um, and cache it. More often we use caches instead of real persisted read models, but you have all the different aspects in our system depending on performance uh, requirements. As we start always with project events if you need them, and if that gets too slow, we introduce either a cache or a real read model. It depends on the use case, how much data is in there. Yeah, so it's always an evolution, starting from plain projecting events. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, is it true that then for some system sub subsystems it's a CRUD, you use CRUD, and for some others you use uh, event sourcing? Yes. What's okay. slices? Probably okay. in, in every subsystem there is some event sourcing, but there could be a slice. Uh, that is CRUD. Like mm -hmm. from, you have uh, issues, so you didn't track your time correctly, you get an issue, and the current issues, these are stored CRUD because the old data isn't important, it's just the current state is important, so that this is CRUD. And this is one slice that stores its data in the CRUD form. But of course, if we generate uh, documents, they are put on a blob storage that's not event sourced as well, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, great. And just to add to this uh, CQRS topic, uh, we also have these additional uh, topics which might be useful for people for reading. So CQRS is for a specific bounded context, not a uh, top level uh, architecture that deals with a lot of concurrency. So I think we saw that here, like it, it wasn't that you overall system architecture that you applied, but rather uh, in a more granular way. And also you did that one, I can't pronounce the name. Uh, I think I thought his videos uh, as well. So this is good for people to maybe uh, learn more later. And we also have another question. Do you use snapshot aka golden master uh, tests? 
Uh, I don't know Golden Master test, but snapshots so are so verified tests. Yes, for oh. example, for everything that we put into JSON, <laughs> because JSON deserialization is hard, and so we make sure that we events. Our new approach is that a lot of the event data in an event is JSON serialized into the database. So we make sure that we test that, that we can get the data back from the database. And also that we have a regression that if we change something and the, the schema uh, would break so that we couldn't read it back. And as I said, for the things that we send to the client or to over the public API to other systems, these are all tested with snapshot tests. Mm -hmm. And maybe one more other related thing for this question, if people want to read further, is looking into uh, contract testing, which is an example that, for example, the client can specify certain uh, contract tests, how it uh, uses the API, so which JSON properties is it using, and then the provider can actually run those tests. So then this way, if, for example, if... Uh, the, if there's a change, unexpected change in the property, uh, some JSON uh, um, mm -hmm. on the REST API, uh, these kind of tests would be able to de detect um, such a problem. Okay. Um, do you have manual testing? Yes. What do the, the client? Testers? So we test all the things in the client manually. For all the things, the back end, we rely on the automated tests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the reason, as you mentioned before, is that your client is quite simple. So it's some simple uh, Angular application, and that most of the bugs there are like bugs and or visual, when, visual issues. When we, when we started, we anticipated that the client wouldn't survive two years, which was true. It was the change from AngularJS to Angular. And then he said, okay, probably the client will not survive uh, the next two years. And we didn't want to invest into tests for something that doesn't survive more than two years. Uh, actually, now the client is five years old, but we never had uh, real problems with our approach. Um, yeah, it needs a little bit more manual testing, but again, this, the, the UI is also very task-based, so a lot of small modules. And if you change or add a feature, you just have a really small spot you have to manually test. So it's possible to do that. And again, if something is wrong, we can fix it very quickly. OK. That's great. So thanks a lot for the meetup today. I think it was enjoyable because we got to see um, your approach regarding architecture and test-driven development on a uh, on your real production uh, projects. That's an example of you know something actually working in practice versus just um, a small uh, kata example. So I want to say you know uh, thanks a lot. And later also in the meetup group we could send links if you have links to the books you recommended or any other um you know recommendations that that you have for reading and also in this youtube description we will also have links so that people can uh connect with you on uh linkedin uh, twitter and then if there's uh, anything else so this is also uh, a thank you message so yeah everyone um appreciate it so yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Dan, and um, I wish everyone a good day and uh, see you all next time. Yeah, thanks for having me and have all a good time and succeeding tests. Thanks a lot. Thank you, everyone. Bye.